everybody. My name is Tim Sullivan. Uh, I am a baritone saxophonist and educator here at Jazz at Lincoln Center. And it is my honor and privilege to be able to introduce Mr. Joe Temperley. Hi. Joe. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Well, we, we met a long time ago. We though, met a long you, time ago. If you remember. Actually, it was about 50, almost 15 years ago right. that we first met, Joe. Right. You've been in New York that long? No, no. I've been in New York about four years. But oh, okay. we first met through essentially Ellington. Yeah. You were actually our mentor with, oh, uh, I see. with one of our bands way, way back when. Right, so, yeah. yeah. So we just had our 18th anniversary. Sure did. This Ab year. Absolutely. So um, you've been an inspiration and an, an influence to me for a very, very long time. So this is an honor to oh, be able to, uh, yeah. to work with you. And, and, My uh, pleasure. So I thought we might start by just picking your brain a little bit, get some, get some history. Okay. All right. Let's see, Joe. So born September 20th, 1929 where? And in a town called Loch Galley, which was a coal mining town in Scotland. In Scotland. Um, so not so much a, a center of, of jazz, you might say. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. What led you to the music? Were your, were your parents musical? No, not at all. What my, brother, my brother pretended to play the trumpet, but he, you know, he bought me a saxophone for my 14th birthday. So that's, uh, I took a couple of lessons here and there. And and uh, six months later, I was playing in local dance bands, you know, six-piece, five-piece bands mm -hmm. in, in local uh, dance halls. Just six months after you got your first horn? So, something like that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Six, nine months, something like that. Now, was your first horn a, a baritone? No, it was an alto. An alto, same here. First it was an alto, alto that my brother paid 25 pounds for. 25 pounds. In Edinburgh. He bought it in Edinburgh. That was for my birthday. Okay. And then uh, um, I... Uh, I got hold of a, a Busha 400, and uh, I, I, that was my alto, and I wish I had it today. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know. I, I traded it for a tenor. I started playing the tenor, and um, I, I gave up my Busha 400, which was a beautiful saxophone, and I started playing the tenor because uh, we already had an alto player in the band. So they decided that uh, they needed a tenor player. So here I am playing tenor. I played tenor for a long time. How long? Oh, I played. I played. I, I was still playing tenor when I went to London, when I was in Tommy Sampson's band. I went to London with Tommy Sampson's band. Tommy Sampson uh, ha had a, a big band. They were all Scottish musicians, and you know there's a there's a great tradition in Scotland of, of brass band players. So there's a lot of very good trumpet and trombone players that came from Scotland. And practically all of them f went from Tommy Sampson's band to Ted Heath's band. Ted Heath's brass, brass band, Ted Heath's brass section was practically all Scottish. Hmm. Now, were brass bands the same as what I think in the UK they call them show bands? Is that right? No, it's not a show it's band, it's a, a brass band. band, you know. Okay. For parades and things like sure, that. Sure, sure, okay. Okay. So uh, I know this, this move to London, that was pretty big, right? I went to London uh, uh, with Tommy Sampson's band and I, uh, I played around, you know, we never got paid in Tommy Sampson's band because there was never any money. How did you make do? Well, he, he paid the hotel expenses and things like that and fed us, and, but there was never as much in the way of money. But I went from there to a small band. Uh, there was a clarinet player. His name was Harry Parry, and he was very famous during the war. Harry Parry and his radio rhythm club, Sextet. And I played with Harry Parry for a while. I went from there to Joe Loss, and Joe Loss had this dance band, and he, he probably was the most popular dance band in the country. Hmm. In fact, when I went to him and told him I wanted to leave and go with Jack Parnell's band, he said to me, why are you leaving? He said, nobody ever leaves my band mm -hmm. until they have their own business. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, he was a, he was a, a strictly a, a businessman. If uh, we played in a dance hall that, that held 2,000, and uh, 1,600 people showed up. He reckoned he lost money. Huh. And that was the way huh. he was. But he was a very fair, decent man. But uh, yeah, that's what he said to me. You don't leave my band until you have your own business. And his uh, idea of my own business probably was a boarding house in uh, Bournemouth or somewhere like that. Mm. <laughs> but I went with Jack Parnell's band. Uh, I, I, I took Ronnie Scott's place. I played with Jack Parnell for a while. Now, now are you on baritone at this point? No. Still not yet. I didn't go on baritone until I went with Humphrey Littleton. Okay. No, Tommy Whittle. I, I played in a band. A friend of mine, Tommy Whittle, tenor player, who left Ted Heath's band. He was a jazz tenor player with Ted Heath. 
and he formed a band, and Kenny Wheeler was in the band. We did some up and down trips up and down the country and one-nighters and things like that, and it lasted about maybe nine months or a year or something. And um, I played I played baritone in that band, and then I went back to the tenor and played with various other bands, and uh, and then eventually uh, Humphrey Littleton called me, and his tenor player was a, a lady called Kathleen Stobart, and she was the tenor player in the band, and she, she went in the hospital to have an operation. So I subbed for her uh, all during the time she was gone. Hmm. And, uh, and when she came back to the band, Humph and I, that was Humph, Humph everybody called him Humph. <laughs> we were having a drink in the bar, and Humph said, I hear you play the baritone, huh? And I hadn't played the baritone in ages. I said, yeah, I do, I play the baritone. <laughs> said, well, how would you like to join my band or, and play the baritone? I said, okay, that would be, that would be fine. And sure enough, I went, I went with Humphrey Littleton and I was there for about eight or nine years. Wow. And Humphrey became like my brother. He became a really close friend. And you know, you're talking about a very aristocratic gentleman mm -hmm. or so they would like to. He went to Eton, which was all the British prime ministers were educated at Eton. And Humph went to Eton. His father was the was the headmaster there. He was always a, like a, a a Labour Party rebel, you know. Mm. Over here, you'd you'd have lived in fear of him being a socialist, but uh, he was a kind of a socialist. He was a very fair, you know, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked with him for a long time. And we used to have tours with uh, American musicians. Buck Clayton used to come a lot, and Jimmy Rushing came a lot. And we used to have tours of Germany and France and places like that with the band, with Jimmy Rushing and, and Buck Clayton. Sometimes Big Joe Turner came over. Wow. Marie Knight came over. And you know, all these people came over and we worked with them over there. So and that was some of your exposure to American musicians coming yeah. over to England. Buck was the first American musician I, I met over there. Okay. And the reason that, that American musicians started coming to, to England was um, when, the, when the rock and roll invasion hit and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and everybody was clamoring in America for the Beatles to come to America. So that was a wonderful outlet for jazz because uh, America got the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, and we got Duke Ellington and mm -hmm. Count Basie. So the British rockers came over to the United States, yeah. and the United, the American jazz guys went over to Europe. The, the, union had a, uh, the, un the British Union had, had this rule. If 20 British musicians went to America. Well, then 20 American musicians could come to England, <laughs> come to Britain. Wow. That way, you know, we saw a lot of Americans. Americans used to come, then started coming to Ronnie Scott's club. Sure. And I saw, I saw Coleman Hawkins there with uh, Milt Buckner on organ and uh, Papa Joe Jones. Wow. I saw Stan Getz and Zoot Sims and Al Cohn and Dexter Gordon and Woody Shaw and Freddie Hubbard. All, they all came to Ronnie Scott's. Amazing. All these American musicians are coming over and you're getting exposure to them, but what really gave you uh, not only insight into the American jazz scene, but it sounds like inspiration was this tour with Humph. And you yeah. went over the United States jazz. For That's really when I, I started you know, getting into playing jazz. And this is the first time in the States for you, that tour? Yeah, in 1959 we came to the States. We had a tour with a Thelonious Monk Quartet, Right. And uh, Lenny Fristano with Warren Marsh and uh, Lee Konitz, Anita O'Day, and uh, George Shearing. Uh, he, he, he had a record called The Velvet Brass. So George Shearing quintet with a brass section. And, and there were two English bands, uh, Humph's band, and uh, Ronnie Ross and Alan Galley quintet. So we did this tour. And I remember when, when we were on the way home, on the way back, and uh, we're sitting in a plane, and New York was, we watched New York, and the, you know, the lights of New York, New York was all lit up then, you know, that was before the, they had the austerity thing and turned half the lights off. And I thought, you know, I must come back here. And sure enough, about five or six years later, I came back to New York, landed in New York on the 16th of December, 1965. Yeah. Aboard the Queen Mary. Aboard the Queen Mary, yeah. Mm -hmm. The old Queen Mary. And also, not uh, to mention, uh, Cannonball Sextet was on that Cannonball tour. Cannonball was on that tour, yeah. too, yeah. yeah. Cannonball, that was the first time I ever saw anybody drink iced tea. I thought, that's terrible. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> actually drinking iced tea, what is that? <laughs> that's it, that wasn't over in Scotland? In, in Never. London, no? 